Chapter 8, Politics. 50 years ago in the United States, protecting the environment and preventing dangerous climate change was an issue everyone got behind. The two major political parties, Democrats and Republicans, took the same stand. Make Earth cleaner and greener. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson announced this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. Johnson was a Democrat. The next president, Richard Nixon, was a Republican, and during his presidency in 1970, Earth Day was established, a day to focus on protecting the planet. That same year, the U.S. government created the EPA Environmental Protection Agency to help protect human health and the environment. The Clean Air Act of 1970 was passed to control emissions and help air quality. Only one member of Congress voted against it. The Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA helps set environmental policy. After Congress passed an environmental law, the EPA figures out the rules, regulations needed to follow the new law. Climate change falls under the Clean Air Act of 1970. That allows the EPA to set emissions limits on factories cars, and more. An environmental movement grew. Groups formed with the idea to protect the planet. Worldwide conferences were held, led by the United Nations an international organization that works toward common goals among many countries. At the very first UN environmental meeting in 1972, climate change gained attention. The focus was on air and water pollution. The group also warned governments to watch out for activities that could lead to warming. Then in the 1980s, scientists made a startling discovery. There was a huge hole in the protective layer of the atmosphere. Chemicals used in certain types of spray cans, like those for hairsprays, were destroying the ozone layer. The ozone layer is part of the upper atmosphere and has a high level of protective gas called ozone. Without it, harmful sun rays could reach Earth. President Ronald Reagan, a Republican, signed a treaty with dozens of other nations to ban the chemicals. The plan worked. The hole is closing. At the same time, the concern about climate change was growing. In 1998, under Democratic President Bill Clinton, the United States signed an agreement called the Kyoto Protocol in Japan. Almost 200 countries agreed to reduce emissions by at least 5% below 1990 levels. In reality, however, little changed. Lowering the release of greenhouse gases was trickier than fixing the ozone layer. Also, the United States Senate never ratified the agreement. In the United States, many businesses, ones that made billions of dollars, counted on people keeping counting on people to keep using fossil fuel energy. For example, oil companies, car manufacturers, and coal producers. 
If there were limits on releasing greenhouse gases, their businesses would suffer. People would be laid off from their jobs. In the United States, certain groups within the Republican Party were on the side of these big businesses. So, some politicians backed away from setting rules for company emissions. They said it was more important for people to keep their jobs and have the economy continue to grow. Soon, people were taking sides along party lines. Ideas on climate change began to divide the country. By and large, Democrats were in favor of tougher laws to protect the environment, while Republicans were against more regulation. In 2001, Republican President George W. Bush formally pulled the United States out of the Kyoto Protocol. He claimed it would hurt the economy. Without the United States, one of the biggest energy users in the world, the Kyoto Protocol fell apart. With Democrat Barack Obama as the next president, there was another shift. He enacted the Clean Power Plan in 2015 to reduce emissions in power plants. It was a call for clean energy. That same year, representatives of nearly 200 countries met in Paris to discuss climate. Once again, an agreement was signed. The agreement stated that all the countries would take steps to slow climate change and limit greenhouse gases, and they would try to do it by a certain year. The target for 2020 to stop global temperatures from rising any more than 3.6 Fahrenheit, two degrees Celsius, higher than they'd been before the Industrial Revolution. Then in 2017, there was yet another shift the new U.S. President, Donald Trump, who was a Republican, rolled back the Clean Power Plan. And at the end of May 2017, Trump announced the United States was pulling out of the Paris Agreement. In his speech, he stated concerned about the country's economy and possible lost jobs. However, many big companies such as Disney, Apple, and Google said the job rate wouldn't be affected. Even some energy companies urged the president to stay in. They thought it would mean big profits for their natural gas divisions. Natural gas is a cleaner energy. And they might get government money to help them develop technology to reduce oil and coal pollution. At first, two other countries, Syria and Nicaragua, did not join the agreement. But they later changed their positions leaving the United States as the one country in the world not part of the Paris Agreement. Well before the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, protests had been organized and rallies held all around the country. People who were worried about the future of Earth participated. The March for Science was held on Earth Day in 2017. Hundreds of marches were held across the country, with the main one in Washington, D.C. Scientists organized the marches to point out their role in helping the planet. They wanted to make sure that fact-based scientific studies of our world's environment continued. Just days later, the EPA announced its website was undergoing changes that reflect the agency's new direction under President Trump. In the meantime, information about climate change was removed. The announcement was followed. The very next day, 
by a series of already planned people's climate marches. The sole focus, climate change. Around 200,000 people from all over the country gathered for the main march in D.C. One high school student went to the March for Science near his Boston home. Then he traveled to D.C. for the People's Climate March. I wanted to deliver the climate facts directly to the center of government, he later stated. Why? Because the risks are so great. March for Science. Chapter 9, Extreme Weather. As the temperature goes up, there are more frequent events of extreme weather. It's because the air has become warmer. Warm air holds more water than cold air. It contains more water molecules. It's damper, more humid, and more likely to turn into vapor. There's more water in the atmosphere. So when it rains, it rains a lot. In fact, there's a better chance it will pour. Floods have become more common. The United States has seen this firsthand. Compared to 50 years ago, some areas have gotten about 67% more rainfall during the heaviest storms. Heavy rains can destroy crops and homes. When these rains hit mountains, they can cause landslides and mudslides. Rivers flood, bridges collapse. People may die. With a warming planet, events like these are expected to happen more often. In August 2016, two feet of rain fell in parts of Louisiana in just three days. Climate scientists took note. The odds of an event like this have increased over the past 100 years by at least 40%, said a Princeton University researcher who worked on one study. One year later, in August 2017, Hurricane Harvey dumped more than four feet of rain over parts of coastal Texas, setting a new record for the continental United States. No other storm had ever dropped so much rain. Commenting on historic flooding in Peru, South America in March, 2017, the research director at the University of Colorado added this, at 400 PPM of CO2, in the atmosphere. The question is not so much, is this event caused by climate change? The question is, which event is not? So what about hurricanes? Are they connected to climate change? The answer is still being debated. In 2005, one of the deadliest hurricanes to ever strike U.S. soil hit Gulf Coast states such as Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. The city of New Orleans, Louisiana was hit particularly hard by Hurricane Katrina. Waves of water poured into the streets, flooding 80% of the city. Seven years later, Hurricane Sandy devastated the Northeast. Entire towns in New Jersey and New York were underwater. Once again, the monster storms turned the nation's attention to global warming. Some studies say it's too early to tell if climate change was the main reason that those storms were so huge. Modern records only go back a few decades. So it's difficult to compare big storms of the past to most recent ones. Some facts though are clear. 
sea levels are rising and higher sea levels cause major flood damage. The Arctic Ocean is warmer. Ice melts, causing seas to rise. Plus, warm drops of water expand. They take up more space. With those effects, global sea levels have gone up about eight inches over the past 100 years. During storms and hurricanes, heavy winds cause a storm surge, a sudden powerful push of water onto land. With higher waters, the surge is greater. Water covers more land, doing more damage. Hurricane Sandy had a record storm surge 13 feet in New York City. In regions near coast, rising water levels mean higher daily tides and more flooding too. From 1998 to 2005, Miami Beach, Florida had 16 floods. From 2006 to 2013, there were 33 floods, more than twice as many. Generally, regions that are already wet will get even wetter, but dry inland areas face other problems, and it's likely those problems will start with heat waves. Chapter 10, Heat Waves. A heat wave is a period of days or weeks of unusually hot weather. With higher temperatures, it makes sense we'd have more heat waves and that they'd last longer. In 2010, Russia experienced one of the worst heat waves on record. For the first time ever, temperatures reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit there. Unused to those conditions and not prepared, about 55,000 people died. That's horrible. Experts from the National Center for Atmospheric Research and other institutions say if greenhouse gas emissions aren't curbed, the number of abnormally hot days could become much more frequent. According to Dr. Michael E. Mann, the Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State University, and Dr. Lee R. Kump, Professor and Head of the Department of Genome Sciences at Penn State, by the end of the century, St. Louis, Missouri, could have more than 40 continuous days of brutal temperatures. And more heat waves means more droughts, long periods with very little rainfall. It may seem strange that global warming can cause both droughts and floods. After all, they are opposite conditions. But remember, warm air holds more water. So in areas with little rain, high temperatures pull moisture from Earth's surface into the air. These drops evaporate, disappear in the heat so the air pulls even more moisture. The ground becomes dusty, lakes and ponds dry up. Think of a pot of boiling water, boiling on a stove. Water in the form of steam escapes into the air. The water level goes down. Leave the burner on too long and the water will disappear. Only a burned pot is left, like parched, cracked ground. California was in a drought from about 2012 to 2016. It was considered part of a 15 year mega drought that lingered across most of the Western United States. Lake Mead 
a reservoir that provides much of California's water, shrank. In spring 2016, it dropped to a record low. It was just 37% full. One study found that California could face permanent drought conditions by 2050, due in part to human-caused climate change. The United States is not alone. Droughts have hit almost every continent. The consequences can be harsh. As in the Lake Chad region of Africa, there are water shortages, failing farms, loss of income, and not enough food. Chapter 11, Famine and Fire. Famine is a lack of food so great that people are in danger of dying. In the African countries of Kenya, Somalia, Djibouti, and Ethiopia, famine goes hand in hand with droughts. Generally, the region has two rainy seasons each year, but when the rains don't come, drought follows. In 2011, the region was hit by the worst drought in six decades. Soil grew sandy. Plants wilted. Farming was impossible. Food was scarce. Many families herded animals for a living, but the herds, like farmers, were in trouble. Without food or water, the animals were dying. In Somalia and other countries, thousands of families left their homes in search of water. They traveled hundreds of miles. Some families made their way to refugee camps in northern Kenya, crowded spaces filled with others in needs. Some families split up. Outside the city of Garissa, Kenya, mothers with young children stayed in poor villages gathering wood to sell. gathering wood to sell for pennies. Fathers kept walking with their herds, trying to find water. No one had enough to eat. In July, 2011, the United Nations declared a famine in Somalia. Between 2010 and 2012, about 260,000 people died, half of them young children. Just five years later, Somalis faced drought and famine conditions again. In the past, it was one big drought every 10 years, said a director at World Vision, an organization that aids children and families. Then it came to one drought every five years, and now the trends are showing that it will be one every three to five years. We are in a crisis. Climate change may not be causing every crisis, but it makes conditions more extreme. In dry areas, droughts and famines are more likely to happen. And in the American West, where there are vast forests, drought leads to a different kind of disaster, wildfires. A warming climate means shorter winters and longer, hotter summers. And during those long, hot summers, Trees dry out. Like kindling, they catch fire quickly and fire spreads faster. Each year, raging wildfires sweep across states from California to Colorado. They start in forests, maybe from a lightning strike or campfire. Flames leap from tree to tree, shrub to shrub, jumping to grassy fields. Closer and closer, to communities. Wildfire season used to last five months. Now it can last more than seven months. 
outbreaks have doubled and tripled. In October 2017, California experienced its deadliest week for wildfires in state history. More than 40 people died. As Mark Cochran, a scientist from South Dakota State University explained, ecosystems are designed to withstand the normal climate situation. But, he went on, we suspect that things aren't normal anymore. Danger, bark beetles. High temperatures bring a beetle boom to forest. Bark beetles live inside trees, blocking water from traveling to branches. The trees dry out and die, becoming a fire hazard and sending more CO2 into the air. Chapter 12, Trouble at Sea. Oceans hold almost all our planet's water. They also hold a lot of CO2, and that causes major consequences. When CO2 joins with seawater, it forms a kind of acid, a harsh chemical. It changes the water's very nature. Sea creatures such as certain clams and oysters make their own shells. The shells help protect them. But with more acid in the water, the shells grow weak. They can even dissolve. Young clams and oysters die off. Entire species are at risk. Krill in the Antarctic. In the warming Antarctic Ocean, krill Tiny shrimp-like creatures are in danger. Their life cycle is tied to water temperature, CO2 levels, and how much seawater there is. With these factors changing, survival is difficult. Although climate change may not be the only cause, krill populations have dropped by 70 to 80%. Krill are a major food source for whales, seals, penguins, fish, and seabirds, some of which are food sources for other sea creatures. Without krill, the entire ecosystem is in danger. The same holds true for bright, multicolored coral and coral reefs. Coral polyps are sea animals similar to jellyfish found in tropical waters. As coral polyps grow, they produce limestone. This creates a hard coral skeleton which grows and grows. Eventually, a coral reef builds up. The Great Barrier Reef lies off the coast of Australia. It has almost 3,000 reefs and hundreds of small islands. It teems with sea life, sponges, plants, and schools of colorful fish swimming in and out of hiding spots. But the reef is in danger. Water chemistry is changing, and so is the water temperature. Over the last 135 years, the global sea surface temperature has gone up 1.1 degree Fahrenheit. Like most climate factors, a small change can make a big difference. And studies show that the most warming has happened most recently. It shows a trend. When ocean water turns warm and acidic, coral feel stress. They lose their color and turn white.
This is known as a bleaching event. They grow weak and are more likely to die. In 2016, the reef experienced the bleaching. It was a great loss of life and color with all its creatures endangered. Then it happened again in 2017. Two years in a row? That was unheard of. Everything was happening faster than expected. Scientists predicted that by 2050, if CO2 emissions didn't slow, the Great Barrier Reef would have bleaching events every year. The climate is changing said an expert from the Great Barrier Marine Park Authority. The overall impact of climate change is a major threat to the future of the reef. This is the present. So what does the future look like? Chapter 13, the present and the future. By the end of this century, oceans could be significantly warmer. Underwater habitats could be in even greater danger. But what if emissions are greatly reduced? Even then, sea levels would still rise a foot or two. What if emissions aren't curved? sea levels could go up more than six feet. But even with the lowest rise, regular tides could be more like king tides. Those are the highest high tides of the year. In Florida, steps are being taken to control flooding. Roads are being raised above sea level. Shopping malls are being built with protective barriers. California too is thinking ahead some areas already have a system to recycle wastewater into tap water to increase supplies. From Florida to California, from polar bear habitats in the Arctic to coral reefs in Australia's Great Barrier Reef, climate change is affecting entire regions. In 2012, we were about two degrees away from the critically dangerous rise of 3.6 Fahrenheit. But since then, we've had yearly record-breaking temperatures, and scientists are still figuring out the exact warming for the decade. One thing is for certain, if emissions keep increasing, their effects can get much worse. However, it can work the other way too. There's talk of charging companies money if they release dangerous emissions. Businesses won't want to pay a carbon tax. So the hope is they'd find another way to power their companies. Some states have formed the United States Climate Alliance, pledging to still meet the Paris Agreement goals. California Governor Jerry Brown even met with the president of China to discuss climate change. And on June 6, 2017, Hawaii, a group of islands sure to be affected by rising seas, became the first state to sign greenhouse gas reductions into law. It's a signal that our planet's dependence on fossil fuels can change. natural gas and nuclear energy. The pros and cons. Natural gas is a fossil fuel drilled from deep beneath Earth's surface. It supplies about 30% of U.S. energy and emits only about half as much CO2 as coal does. But natural gas is mostly methane. Methane escapes during drilling and can leak from pipelines. 
One removal method known as fracking has been linked to earthquakes. Nuclear reactors use the element uranium to produce energy. These power plants split the most basic unit of uranium, the atom releasing energy from the nucleus, which is the atom's core. No greenhouse gases are emitted, but the process leaves toxic, poisonous waste and can cause health problems. Reactors can have meltdowns too, with uranium burning through the reactor and releasing harmful radiation into surrounding areas. All over the world, people are already using renewable energy. Some sources generate power with zero or very little emissions, and they'll never be used up. Plus, renewable energy has become cheaper over time. It's a growing industry. In 2016, more Americans were employed in solar energy work than in coal, gas, and oil jobs combined. In rural areas of Africa, China, and India, solar panels are providing power to villages. Earlier, these areas couldn't connect to electric grids. Now people have refrigerators, lights, and more. It's changed lives. In Chile, a giant new solar power plant was built in a dry, sunny desert. It can provide electricity for one million people Solar panels are springing up in parking lots across the United States. They're set up as canopies above cars, protecting them from heat, rain, and snow. Wind power is growing too. More and more turbines are being built on farms. They can power one farm or many. Everywhere, people are driving electric cars that don't burn fuel or hybrids. They use a mix of electricity and gas. Any kind of cycling saves energy. So does walking, taking a bus or train or carpooling with friends. It means fewer vehicles on the road. What can save energy at home? Special light bulbs called LED lights use at least 75% less energy and they last 25 times longer than regular bulbs. We all know that something as simple as turning off lights when you leave a room can help. Don't run water. Turn off the faucet while you brush your teeth. Taking action helps reduce your carbon footprint lowering how much CO2 you produce. So what will be your impact on the environment? Do you believe that climate change presents a real danger in the immediate future to our planet? If so, what will you do about it? Timeline of climate change. Bibliography. The end. What is climate change? That was a very good read. Enjoy.